concentrations of PFAS chemicals were up to 12 times higher than international standards. They're called forever chemicals, and in Australia we usually associate them with firefighting foam used on military bases. But they're also used in many everyday products. That's because PFAS, polyfluoroalkyl and perfluoroalkyl substances, are very good at repelling oil, heat and water. And they've been used so widely that researchers now find traces of them in the environment, in waterways and even in people. So it's getting into everything. That's right, that's everywhere, yeah. It's a consumer-driven problem in that we've wanted anti-stain products, we've wanted anti-stick, and we thought these chemicals were indestructible, and they are indeed indestructible, and they last for a very long time in the environment and in humans. The World Health Organization has found that one of the main PFAS chemicals, PFOA, is carcinogenic. Studies have shown associations between PFAS and other illnesses as well, which is why health is one of the main concerns. And that's why I'm about to get a blood test to find out if there's any PFAS in me. Hi, how are you? I'm well, you? Good, thank you. I'm very squeamish, you can't look. It's not so bad, thank you. Oh. You're professional. <laughs> the current advice from the federal government is that there's limited evidence linking these chemicals to human disease. A lot of research has focused on areas where people have been exposed to high levels of PFAS. The Health Department acknowledges that studies have found associations between two of the most common types of PFAS and certain cancers, as well as a risk of higher cholesterol, reduced kidney function, lower birth weight in babies, and earlier onset of menopause. As the risks from PFAS chemicals have become known, there's been pressure on companies to phase okay. them out. As head of product innovation for US clothing maker Patagonia, Matt Dwyer says finding alternatives hasn't been easy. So anything you want, they can make it. These chemistries have been deployed for decades to solve any number of problems, whether that's oil repellent coatings, whether that's waterproof and water repellent coatings like we use in apparel. On a day like today, you go reaching for the raincoat or the puffer jacket. But the thing that makes waterproof clothing waterproof has generally been PFAS. So I've got all these different things here. This is made with recycled fishing nets. Yep. It's like, you, it's like reading a book trying to buy a yeah. jacket. That's why we have these little books on each one of the uh, yeah, yeah. garments. Patagonia says all its products will be PFAS free by 2025. So here it says PFC free laminate. Is that, that's basically the yeah. saying there's no PFAS. Yeah, so in a waterproof garment like this, historically that's where PFAS would have been used. Yep. There is no longer any part of this garment that yeah. uses those those chemicals. But that's been a long journey, hasn't it? Like, I mean, you didn't find overnight the replacement for PFAS, it's taken a while. No, I think it's it's been about a 10 year journey for us. Matt Dwyer says removing PFAS means you lose some of the protective qualities that made these chemicals so attractive in the first place. The first sample we ever got in of a water repellent chemistry made without PFAS, you could pick it up and rip it in half like a sheet of paper. PFAS free, super nice. And what we're trying to do is match the quality and someday get to a point where we're back to the high, high performance that we saw 15, 20 years ago from these chemistries. The Australian government says it'll ban three of the most common types of PFAS from July next year. They say the ban will apply to any product that contains these chemicals. The apparel industry at large still have big problems to solve byproducts of those manufacturing processes that have been released into the natural environment now for decades and decades have some really problematic side effects. While I wait for my test results, I want to know how much PFAS is in the environment. There are literally thousands of these chemicals, many of them hard to detect. They're now turning up in unlikely places, inside polar bears and in ocean spray. And some of these chemicals break down extremely slowly. 
so what water are we analyzing here? We're analyzing the stormwater outflow here at the north end of Kuji. Would you expect stormwater to have PFAS in it? Yeah, it's often pretty common to have reasonable concentrations of PFAS. Yeah, it, it, it's indicative of human activity. It's definitely you know, in the products that we use and uh, pharmaceuticals, things we put on our face. So it's on a lot of clothes. Would it be in washed off clothes and go into your wash and then get into the runoff as well? Yeah, that's the expectation. This team from the University of New South Wales is interested in the amount of PFOS and PFOA in stormwater. Both of them will be on Australia's list of banned PFAS chemicals. Certain PFAS have been designated as carcinogens. Yep, that's right. How concerning do you think the level is? Well, of course it's concerning, but it's, it's a lifetime exposure, so you have to have repeated exposure over your whole life for, you know, be, have, you know get cancer. I've got my results from my blood test, and it looks like some of them have come back positive to PFAS chemicals. Now I've just got to talk to somebody who can explain to me what these results actually mean. I'm here to meet ANU professor Martin Kirk. The three ones that we would expect to see, which is PFOS, mm -hmm. PFHXS and PFOA, are all there. That's exactly what we'd expect. We'd call that background. Would most people in Australia, if they did this blood test, have a similar rate to me? Very similar, yeah. Okay, so I'm basically the norm. Where is this coming from? I wear waterproof jackets all winter. Am I getting it off that, or is it more likely that I'm getting it through what I eat or drink? Well, look, probably what you eat and drink, but um, I, I would say that it's probably level sort of come from some time ago, so it's not necessarily getting constantly exposed. We should limit our exposure to these chemicals, but that is what I would see as very low. In actual fact, rates have been going down. Correct. And is that because there's been bans of some of these chemicals? Yeah, and I think the companies that have manufactured them have also realised that these chemicals last for a very long time in the environment and also in humans. How worried should I be about this from a health perspective? I'm not a doctor, but I think it's really important to say that um, you can't diagnose any health conditions related to this right now. People do excrete them over time. The half-life, which is how long it takes for someone to get rid of half of the level for, say, PFHXS is up to six years. But we would expect it to come down over time. Professor Kirk says I'm more likely to ingest PFAS from what I eat or drink. I'm concerned about how much PFAS there is in our stormwater, but I'm more concerned about whether or not there's PFAS in our drinking water. In Australia, the standards for PFOA, which is the carcinogenic PFAS, are 560 parts per trillion. In America, four parts per trillion. Does this fit into the American standards? I want to test it and find out. <laughs> All right, so Dennis, we've got our results. We sure do. Um, let's start with tap water because that's the one I drink more often than storm water. Uh, how are our results on tap water? They look really good, yep. They're below Australian drinking water limits. So the Americans have got the lowest standard, which is four parts per trillion. Yep. Are we under that? We certainly are, yep. So no PFAS really in the drinking water. No but I see red numbers under the stormwater, so we actually found it in the stormwater. It was in the stormwater, traces of human activity, which we would expect in the stormwater at Bondi and also at Kuji. And what kind of levels? They, they would be above, not above Australian drinking water limits, but they'd be above the US EPA, European Union and Health Canada limits. So would you consider that to be a high rate? No, it's normal of what we would find in the environment at other urban sites in Sydney. You've tested for like 20 PFAS here. Do we need to be testing for more? Absolutely. We need to figure out how, what type of PFAS are out there because there's a lot of PFAS in the consumer products that we use that we don't test in the environment. There's still a way to go before we know all the effects of these chemicals. 
particularly when there are so many types of PFAS that we're not testing for. We should be looking for alternatives and ones which are um, better and less persistent in the environment. The issue is the manufacturing of these chemicals and how the byproducts of that manufacturing have been used or abused for the last 70 or 80 years. The solutions are there and we need to phase out of them as soon as we can. 